okay. Good morning. It's a good way to start the new year in church. It really is. I got some little readings here, reminders. Kind of reminders maybe in starting the new year. Life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. No point to it. Good little reading, it? Money says earn me. A calendar says turn me. Time says plan me. Future says win me. Beauty says love me. But God says remember me. That's a good saying. Here's the last one. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Glad we got a lot of nice people. Thank you all for coming and happy to be here too. The Bible says we need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labors are not in vain. You got your Bible this morning. I want to talk to you out of the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis started reading the Bible through again. I always do this. I'm kind of a preacher of habit. I generally, the day after Christmas, I start in the book of Genesis and I read the Bible through. I always finish up in November. Sometime after Thanksgiving. But I started again after Christmas. But as I started reading in the book of Genesis and I always I know I did a series of messages one time titled New Beginnings and preached several messages on that particular subject. But I started thinking as I was reading Genesis, you know, this kind of popped in my mind. And that's kind of the way I get sermons. I feel that's maybe the Lord or the Holy Spirit speaking my heart. But I got to thinking how many times, you know, that how God's Word is so full of actually reminders. And those reminders are not only just verbal, but they're even visual reminders. And you know, even life itself, there's a lot of visual reminders in life. In fact, the matter, one of the first reminders that kind of stood out to me, it's actually here in the book of Genesis, and it's a verbal reminder and uh, it's actually the words of, of the Lord there, words of God to Adam. And you know, so this morning I kind of want to focus on that. I want us to read a few verses of Scripture out of Genesis. And this is very familiar, I know, to each and every one of us. But uh, in Genesis, in the second chapter of the year, we... We actually see this verbal reminder was made to Adam who God actually formed him out of the dust of the ground. That's where I want to start reading this morning. If you want to follow along, I'm going to read over to verse 17. And it says in Genesis 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man become a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there He put the man whom He formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence was it parted, and became unto four heads. The name of the first was Pishon, that is, in which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There was Obelion and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Guile. The same it is it 
that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hadeka, that is, which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest be free. Here's the first verbal reminder in the Bible. Verse 17. And the tree of the knowledge of the good and the evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank You for this opportunity to gather here with our church family, brothers and sisters in the Lord. We pray, Lord, now that we might just be able to set aside the clear mind, set aside the things of this whole world and simply focus for a few more moments here upon Your Word. Bless our time, Lord, we pray. Again, Father, we pray that we might grow, Lord, in faith. We pray, Lord, again, that's already been prayed here. If there's someone that's never really exercised faith in Christ, pray it might be a day of salvation. So bless our time, Lord, we commit it to You. Honor Yourself. We pray the church can be edified, that Christ can be glorified. In His name, I pray. You know, Genesis 2 in the Bible, Genesis is the book of beginnings, so to speak, in the Bible. And boy, it's, a, it's an interesting book. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible, in the, in the Old Testament. I always say the Old Testament, you know, it's not really, the majority of it is the history of the nation of Israel, but it shows us, gives us such a good, clear picture of how God brought about the nation of Israel, gives us a good clear picture of the lineage that Jesus Christ would come through. It's a book that's maybe not really written to us, but it's written for us in the sense that it's a book that we can learn so much from as a New Testament church. Paul said whatsoever things are written aforetime, and again the Scriptures that Paul was talking about, was the Old Testament. He said over in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things are written aforetime, they're written for our learning. That we, through the patience and the comfort of the Scripture, we might have hope. So the Old Testament is so, so important to the New Testament believer. But here in Genesis chapter 2, I've always felt that, you know, we kind of get a little more of a detailed account really of the creation or God creating man and woman and putting them, you know, into this place, this Garden of Eden. The word Eden, basically in the Hebrew language, it means pleasant, it means delight. So apparently it was a place that was very pleasant place to be. I've always thought it was kind of like a a heaven sort of a place. You know, man and woman was put in there. They were in a state of innocence, so to speak. They had everything in there that really they needed. They even, I'm sure they even enjoyed the work that God had given them. We don't do so, so much today. A lot of people enjoy their work. I hope and pray that you do. But you know, again, tonight we'll talk about a we'll talk tonight with the Lord's help about a actually a visual reminder that reminds us of some things, you know, that resulted from them taking for granted, so to speak, this uh, this verbal reminder that they should not eat of this tree of this knowledge of good and evil. But here in verse seven, first of all it's interesting because you know, we see how man was formed from the dust of the ground. And you know, as I've read that and studied that, 
the first part of this particular verse, it's very, very important. The forming of man from the dust of the ground. In fact, the matter, when you read Genesis, you find out, you know, that even the animal life and all of those was made in, in that sort of a way, or they came from the earth or from the ground in that way. But you know, this form dust was far from really being a man until God communicated this life to this mass of clay, so to speak. In other words, when He done that, the Bible says that He became a living soul. In other words, God breathed divine breath, divine breath into man. In the man's nostril, man became this living soul. So God here, you see, He initially in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, we see God giving life here. It's what we see. It's almost interesting when you read the New Testament, you see God offering eternal life, everlasting life to whosoever that's willing to believe and put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Both of those things are very, very important to you and I. You know, the Bible talks about the soul it really does. And you know, I believe with my heart that the Bible is very clear that the soul is going to live on and on and on someplace. Fact of the matter, Christ over in Matthew in the 10th chapter, He made really a distinction between the soul and the body and man. He done that. If you'd want to look at that and underline that, in your Bible, because sometimes it's a little hard maybe to wrap our minds around the soul of man, the body. You know, the Bible teaches we're made up of body, soul, and spirit. Now, you guys may all understand that, but you know the individual out there on the street, your neighbor, your family, they don't understand that they have an, an, an eternal element about them. They really don't understand that. They don't understand that that eternal element is going to spend eternity someplace or the other. They don't understand that. So again, like I say, Christ made the distinction between the body and the soul. He done that when He was trying to teach these disciples that they were not to fear man. Now listen, this fear of man, it's something that's very detrimental to the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In that name, Amen, Jack. All of us, you know, we like to dress up, look pretty nice, go to church on Sunday. And, and, and don't misunderstand me, that's a good witness. But if we allow man, to keep us so silent, you know, we're almost falling into that category of having such a fear of man that it keeps us from, it keeps us maybe from being a, a verbal reminder of those that surround the us. Boy, when God opens the door for us to be able to, maybe to, scripturally try to show somebody their greatest need in life. That's the reason Peter, he said, be ready always to give a hope that's in you. To do that with, be ready always to give an answer to those that ask you of the hope that's in you. And to do it with meekness and with fear. In other words, with kindness and love in your heart. We're to try to speak the truth of God. Because, you see, if we believe the Word of God, there's an eternal element about us. When God breathed that breath of life into that first man, He become a living soul. You know, that individual become a breathing, living soul made in the very image of God. And we already see that in Genesis, in Genesis 1.26. There is something 
very, very special between God and our Creator. And you see, Jesus made this distinction when He was trying to, what He was trying to do, He was trying to take away that fear that He knew was going to paralyze these disciples if they feared man more than they feared God. If they done that. They was not going to be able to be the extension of this ministry of Jesus Christ. And guess what? It's what the church is today. We're an extension of the ministry of Jesus Christ. What His last words that He told to those disciples, it ought to be what drives us as a church. It ought to be the motivating force of the church trying to get the Gospel, trying to get this good news that there's life, there's eternal life. You can spend this life eternally in the presence of the Lord one day instead of out of the presence of the Lord. You see, in this book of Genesis you find out even in this even in this garden where God put them in this good place where God put them we find out that old that the old serpent there we find out that he went himself really to that fallen angel which became the true serpent or Satan himself and you know ended up beguiled Eve there in that perfect place Satan was very active. But you know something? The Lord was very, very active. And He's still active today. He wants to be active in our lives as we try to be. But fear is something that can paralyze. That's the reason Jesus told these disciples in, in Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 26, Fear them not, therefore... For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid, that it shall not be known. What I tell you, he said, in darkness, that speak you in light, is what he's saying. And what you hear in the ear, that you need to preach upon the housetop. He was telling them they need to proclaim his very words. And he said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are able to kill the soul. Other words, fear not them which, which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. So to me, when I read that, Christ makes a very clear distinction between the body and between the soul of the individual. There's a soul that's going to live on and on someplace or the other. I'm glad that God in His love toward us, He's made us a place. I'm glad that the message so much in the New Testament is about this life and this reconciliation, this eternal life, that we can have that starts even right now in our life. It's almost characterized as an abundant life by Jesus Christ. Boy, don't you realize this morning people living without the Lord, they're only living about a half a life. I went several years in my life just living a half a life. Why? Because the Lord was not a part of it. I've never been spiritually awakened. I've never received what God has made available for whosoever will. So you see there in chapter verse 7 in the Scripture, you see God breathing into this mass of dust. And this mass of dust became a living soul is what it becomes. In verse 7 and 8 where I read, we see God planting them in planting this garden and planting a garden there in this Eden. And, and this was Adam's home. You see, God's got a 
home for you and I one day that's received Christ. Christ referred to it as the Father's house. And there's many mansions that's in that place. But here we see God planting this garden in Eden. This was Adam's home. It had within it every tree there that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. In verses 10 through 14, we see in that place there was plenty of water. There was gold. This obel obelium, or I may not be pronouncing it right, but it was a kind of a rosin or a, an aromic gum of some kind that, that emitted a pleasant odor. There was the onyx, the precious gems. All of these apparently was in this place. But in verse 17, like I said, we see this verbal reminder there. This verbal reminder in God's Word as you read the Word of God. It's full of those verbal reminders all the way through. Webster said a reminder is something that causes you to remember. You know, it's something. We live in a day and age where all of these electronic devices, even your cell phone, you know, it has reminders built within them. We've got a refrigerator. I never thought that I'd ever had a refrigerator that would tell you when the door was left open. But we've got a refrigerator that'll uh, it'll give you an alarm if you leave the refrigerator door open. It's a reminder. We've even, God, when He made us, He built all of these built-in reminders in us. You know, we all have pain, but isn't it a good thing that we've got pain? I tell you, every winter, every winter, I burn firewood and cut firewood. And I'm a pretty busy person. Aren't I, Darlene? <laughs> Every winter, my, my thumb, it cracks right there. And boy, it's sore. Right there to my finger. And that thing reminds me. I try to button my shirt, it hurts. I mean, just a tiny little place. I can see skin in there, or back in there, flesh. But you know something? That pain reminds me the importance of the skin that we have on our body. How it protects us. There's all kind of reminders. Some of you may be getting hungry right now. God's even put a mechanism in us that reminds us in that way. And you know something for a believer? I read this the other day as I was studying and it's kind of interesting. It's over in John in the fourth chapter. We have the greatest reminder as God's people for if you're saved this morning. And that's this thing that Christ promised these disciples that He would leave them. He said it was expedient that He'd go away. But over in John 14, He starts teaching the disciples. And we've all read this many, many times. He starts teaching the disciples about this Comforter that would come. That's how Christ is with us today. It's in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason He could tell the disciples, Lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age or the world. It would be the Comforter. This Comforter, you see, is a reminder. Fact of the matter, in John 14 and verse 26, Jesus says these words, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, when whom the Father will send in My name, He'll teach you all things, and He'll bring all things to your remembrance. That word remembrance there in the Greek, and it's only used a couple times in the New Testament in this way. And you know what that word really means? In the Greek, that word means to remind quietly. 
That Holy Spirit works in our lives to remind us. It's that still, small voice that wants to remind us. And that's what Christ was teaching these disciples. It's going to be there as a quiet reminder. It also carries the thought to suggest something. It's going to bring things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said <coughs> unto you. You see, that was going to be a very important tool. It was going to be a very important part of this ministry of these disciples. They was not going to have a King James Bible to carry along with them to open up and let me show you what God says. They, wouldn't, they, they didn't have that, you see. What we have today, God, and boy, as you read the Scriptures, you see that being fulfilled right to the T. That Holy Spirit, you see there, reminding them. Does it remind us? Yes, it does. Boy, I've told you this. And you know, Mom played an important part in my life. And I've heard her say, she used to go with me when I was preaching other places. And she, she was kind of, she didn't want to preach well. You know, she'd be a bad devil. I'd say, you're a backseat preacher. She would. That's something I'd say, and she'd it'd stick in her head, and she'd expound on it. You know, as we're going home. But I've heard her say it many times. That Holy Spirit will let you know when you're not doing what you need. Let you know something. We can quench it. We can grieve it. We need to be full of it. We need to yield. You don't need any more of it if you're saved. What happens, it needs more of you in your life. As we yield more and more to us, it's going to be so, so beneficial. It is a, it's a quiet little reminder that's right within us. It's a staying resonance. And that's what really even Jesus was teaching those disciples even there in the Gospel of John in the 14th chapter. He said these words also. I don't want to share these with you. You know, He, he, he tells them, he, he said unto them, if a man loves me and he, will, and, and he will keep my words and my Father will love him and will come unto him and will make our abode with him. It'll become a staying resonance in our, in, in, our, in our lives. It's almost like if someone's staying in your house. I don't know if that's good or not, but if they are, you know, we want to we wanna make them as comfortable as we can and try to provide for them. It takes a little... It takes a little effort on our part to try to make that abode in our homes a good place. It's the same way in the spiritual realm. We need to yield more and more to God's Spirit in our lives. It'll become more, if we do that, it'll be a lot more of a prominent, still, quiet reminder. Remind in our life. Yes, you see, this first verbal reminder was, Thou shalt not eat. We've got a, a reminder. Well, I, I, I thought, you know, as I was thinking about that, I thought about our appetite. You know, we have a pretty hearty appetite. You know the word appetite? I looked that up in the Webster Dictionary. That thing means a physical desire. But you know something? And I just read about old Esau. He sold his birthright. I don't know if he was totally driven by it. He was hungry when he came in there. And he sold that to Jacob. 
shot itself totally in the foot. What I'm saying, this physical desire, this appetite, man, it can take us right down the wrong road if we're not careful. It can do that. It can take us down the wrong road. And this causes this physical appetite. It might be a sexual appetite. How many of that's taken people down the wrong, wrong road? Absolutely. All kinds of things that we can almost put in that category. Yes, it can take us down the wrong road. And the Bible gives us an account of that. You see, that's the reason. That's the reason that we need to counteract this old natural man. That's the reason we need a, a spiritual element about us. You see, over in 1 Corinthians, maybe you don't have this underline. You might want to look at it in your Bible because it talks here about a natural man. And look what Paul teaches the church about the natural man. Because we kind of still deal with this old fleshly part of us. But in 1 Corinthians, look what Paul says. You might want to underline it in your Bible. In 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, uh, I mean the 1 Corinthians, uh, the 2nd chapter, excuse me, verse 14, it says the natural man, look what Paul says about it. What is the natural man? The natural man really in the Scripture is the unregenerated person. Each and every one of us was like that at one time. We're born as a natural person. The Bible says, David said, Behold, I was shaped in the hand in sin did my mother conceive me. And you know, we know, all know. No need even talking about it. We know that it all happened because of this violation of this first verbal Reminder from God to Adam. He didn't pay attention to it. But you see here in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about, but the natural man, he said, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God that are foolishness unto them, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You can probably look back on your own life and you can see yourself as a natural man. I sure can. Just did what I wanted to do. That's it. Old number one was in the driver's seat. And I'm glad I've got someone else helping me drive today. We need that. Because I'm telling you one thing. Without the Lord, so many people's going down the wrong road today. That's the reason we need so much this spiritual help about us. How that needs so fulfilled in our lives and how we need to how we need to have a, a spiritual appetite about us, the hunger and thirst. That's what Jesus was teaching when he taught those Beatitudes over in Matthew 5, 6. He said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's beneficial, you see. It, it's beneficial to us. Yes, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness is undo it, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned, but he that is spiritual, this is you and I, if you're saved this morning, he that is spiritual, he judgeth all things, yet himself is judged of no man. Who for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have, Paul saying, the mind of the Lord. We have the mind of the Lord. In other words, Paul was saying here, the natural cannot even make good, intelligent, spiritual decisions. But the man, you see, that's been quickened, the man that's been made spiritually alive, we have the capability or the potential to understand spiritual things. You want to know why the churches are not full? Because of the natural man. There's no interest in it. Why do we see things are happening? the way we see them happening today? Why is the Lord's Day Wednesday night used for every other thing other than the house of the Lord? Because the natural man is getting his way in America. That's what it is. 
pretty plain. And, well, it is. Natural man, they receive it not the things of the Spirit of God. They don't see a value in them. All they see a value in is the things that they can feel or touch or, you know, all of these physical things. Why? The God of this age, Paul gives us the answer. The God of this age has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest this glorious gospel would shine in you. You rejoice this morning if the gospel has penetrated your heart and by faith you've received Jesus Christ. You're not the natural man. You're the spiritual man and woman. That's what you are. You're the spiritual. You have the potential to make spiritual, to make spiritual decisions, you see. You can understand spiritual things and you can judge righteous judgment. Why? Because you're spiritual. My, my old Schofield Bible, I put a note in there that says Paul divides men into three classes. Number one is the natural man. Natural man is the Adamic man. He's unrenewed, he's unregenerated through the new birth. Secondly, it's the spiritual man. This is a renewed man. He's filled with spirit. He's walking in the spirit of the Lord. The third is the carnal man. The Bible talks a lot about the carnal man. The carnal man very well is a saved man. He can, you know, he's he, but he again, he's he's renewed man, but he's walking in the flesh. He remains a babe in Christ Jesus. So it almost always thought that was pretty good. There's four things this morning. If you want to write these four words down real quickly and real quick. There's four things from this first verbal reminder. This first verbal reminder, thou shalt not eat. We see first of all a disregard. Boy, that's so natural. When we disregard the Word of God. When we disregard God's Word, the word disregard it means to pay no attention. We ignore it. When, God, when one goes through life and disregards the reminders, you see, and disregards God's Word, boy, what a slippery, slippery slope that that individual or those individuals are on. You see, think what happens, you see, when people go through life. Think what happens. Think what happens. I mean, you might, you might within your mind, you might think of a scripture. Maybe, maybe Paul. I mean, Paul gives all kind of reminders. Look in your Bible just real quick. Look, look with me just over in 2 Corinthians. Back over there. Because just, just look at this reminder that Paul gives to the Christians. To the Christians. And boy, let me tell you, we've all probably felt the effects maybe of this in one way or the other. But look in 2 Corinthians. You might want to underline this. This is a very familiar Scripture. 2 Corinthians in the 6th chapter, verse 14, Paul says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What's he saying? Be a snob. Don't have any affiliation with unbelievers. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is don't get yourself hitched up with some unbeliever. May not, it may not work out. It's a reminder. Paul was just simply reminding the church, reminding Christians. Boy, how many people's entered into marriage relationships. They've, they've maybe even been, I'll tell you, somebody meets with me. Always bring this out. It may work out. Let me tell you one thing. You may be stepping out of bounds a little bit on the Word of God. Get yourself into a heap of trouble. It may work out. Worked out for me and Darlene pretty rocky for a long, long time. I'll bet she never understood this verse of Scripture at all. I'll bet nobody ever sat down and really tried to explain this. This is a reminder. Paul's reminding God's people. He's reminding the church. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he gives the example. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? They're not compatible. It's not saying that we're not to try to reach them. That's the ones we're, we're to try to reach. What communion has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? Satan is what he's saying. 
What part is he that believeth with an infidel? An infidel. An unbeliever is what he's talking about. That's what the Muslims, they call us infidels. I seen on the Fox News, one of them Muslims that the Congress had given prayers. Did anybody see that? Very prominent Muslim a few years ago. He was saying the prayers before the Congress. You see, we're very inclusive anymore in America. Even some of the churches, they felt they had to be inclusive. And we ignore this thing. We're treading on thin ice. That very same individual, yeah, they exposed him as, as making an open statement however many years later that America was simply a garbage dump. Showed him a saying his prayer. They can't even end their prayers up there in Jesus' name. I wouldn't want to go pray for them. They want me to come down and pray at Charleston. I've got letters. I ain't going to go down and pray there. They don't want you to pray in Jesus' name. I went down there and might start preaching. <laughs> the day, you see, they want to drive it all out. Don't pay no attention to it. Yes, Paul's saying, Paul's saying, what agreement has the temple of God with the idols? For you are the temple of the living God. You're the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, I will be their people, they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be the separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and my daughters, is what Paul's saying. So what's he saying? It's a verbal, verbal reminder is exactly what it is. And boy, oh boy, we need to take that verbal reminder to heart. Yes, you see, disregard is dangerous. Number two, from this first verbal reminder, we see, first of all, a disregard. Secondly, when we disregard, we see a disobedience. Boy, I read this morning just a little bit. You know who the first king of Israel was? Saul. There's a man. There's a man that disregarded the Word of God. You know who the Word of God was? Samuel too. He didn't take to heart at all what the old prophet Samuel had warned and told him to do. In fact, the matter he even intruded into the priest's office, so to speak. And then when he was supposed to go and to wipe out the Amalekites, he kept back some of the things. And that's where Sam. That's where Sam. Well, you could look at it, my lands. It's over in First Samuel, in about fourteen or fifteenth chapter. There, that's where Samuel told him in First Samuel fifteen. Samuel says, "Has the Lord?" And Samuel he said, and he's speaking this to Saul. Has the Lord as great delights in burnt offering and sacrifice as in obey the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken the facts of land. For the rebellion is of the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and adultery. I wrote in my Bible right above that. It's never right to do wrong or it's never wrong to do right. That's a good saying. Obeying God is more important than bringing sacrifices. Spiritual acts are of little importance if we're disobeying or rebelling against God. Secondly, wanted us to see that. You see, from this first verbal reminder, we see a disregard. We see a disobedience. Thirdly, we see a division. We see a division. Oh, this division, this division, it resulted from the disregard and the disobedience. It's the first time that we see this, this, this division in the book of Genesis. In fact, the matter you see it. You see it over in Genesis 3 where it says the Lord God, He sent them forth from the garden 
of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You see, God here, God here drives them out. Drives them out. Here in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, we see this division taking shape is what we see. We see this separation of God from man in that way. So again, like I say, all from this verbal reminder, we see this we see this disregard. We see this disobedience. We see this division. Isaiah echoes the very same truth over in Isaiah. I used to have this thing all memorized. Isaiah 59. Isaiah says, no, I can't get it through my head. Isaiah 59. Behold the Lord's hand. I think it is. Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. Yes, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that He cannot save. Neither is His ear heavy that He cannot hear. But look what Isaiah says. But your iniquities, your sins have separated between me, between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not. He will not hear. You see, it was not due to the lack of power on the Lord's part, but it was due to sin because sin truly separates. It divides us from God. We see it very early here when they violated that first verbal reminder. Fourthly, we see not only division, we see but we see death. And you know, here's the picture of death. Adam, when you read over in Genesis 5, you see Adam lived to be 930 years old, basically. But again, that verbal reminder became a reality. What is death? It's again a visual reminder, you see, of that first, of that first command there that was violated. So death, failure to take this first biblical reminder, this biblical, this verbal reminder, seriously brought on this visual reminder, which was death. Adam lived to that. Yes, Paul talks about this, how this disobedience, how this disregard, all over in Romans, in the fifth chapter, Paul says these words, wherefore he talks about him there. That one man, you see, sin entered and death entered by sin. But he also says in Romans 5, therefore, he says, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one many shall be. For by one man's offense, death, it reigned by one much more they which receive the abundance of the grace, the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one man, Jesus Christ. This morning, I just want us to kind of raise our awareness. As you read the Bible, you might want to underline some of these reminders. Yes, there's a lot of even visual reminders as we study the Word of God. I'm so glad you see there was one who sent to conquer death for you and I. And Christ showed that. He showed it at the tomb of Lazarus when He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believeth on Me, though it were dead, yet shall it live. You know the worst thing about this, this uh, violation of this verbal, first verbal reminder was it not only brought physical death and this division, it brought really a spiritual death. Really, really did. Paul, he says, you know, likens people as being dead in their trespasses and in their sins. So this morning as Garrett comes, as Pam comes, we'll have a
time of prayer this morning. There's something on your heart that you need to pray about. Yeah, there's so many verbal and even visual reminders of God's Word. It's all around us. It's in nature. It's built within us. And again, I think so many of those things are there to try to get our attention. If you need to pray this morning, or you need to start this new year out with prayer. Most of all, I hope to pray to let it say, if you're not saved, you're not a Christian. Boy, what a good way to start out 2013 to make that decision. How do you need to do that? You need to put your faith and your trust in Christ. Be willing to repent of your sin. Trust Christ as Savior. Jesus says, if you'll confess me before man, I'll confess you before the Father, which is in heaven. If you want to come openly, publicly, this morning, make that decision, I'll pray that you talk with you maybe this morning. If you just need to pray about something Christian, that's between you and the Lord. Gary, what do you have? Page 62, the only way we can come to this house of the Lord. Pray, come. Your deal or something. This is a good one. Good way to get on your feet, to get on your knees. Good way to get on your feet, to get on your knees. Just Okay. 
thank you all for coming today. Thank you for your attention. And like I say, just wanted us to see, and I'll be doing the Lord's help another message out of Genesis to see if you can come. Uh, planning meeting, 5 o'clock. You all can come. That would be great. We'll try to kind of do out of the church calendar of events so that everybody will have access to that. Thank you all for coming. You'll it's nice having you here. And you know, also your son and Yeah, nice having you. It's great to be here. Ask you to pray for the Morrison family with that funeral yesterday. Just ask you to lift that family. Okay, we'll have some prayer.